Noticed in the recent years during the State of the Union, the President will uh, come to a point in a speech where he'll point up to the balcony and introduce some ordinary citizen who is a ordinary, everyday hero of our country. You may not know it, but it started, a cu the custom started with Ronald Reagan, who introduced a man named Lenny Stutnik. To this day, presidential aides are asked by, the, by reporters, who are the Stutniks this year? Remember the story? Remember who Lenny is? Lenny was a federal worker walking down the street minding his own business until the day that Air Florida Flight 90 crashed into the Potomac. The flight had just taken off from Washington bound for Florida. It had ice on its wings and it brought the plane down as it tried to clear Washington's 14th Street Bridge. You probably remember some scenes from it. In the next several moments, several passengers were thrown into the icy river. A helicopter soon came by, dropping down ropes, but they could only save one person at a time, and that meant that others had to remain in the icy water. There was a lady in the water who was struggling to grab for the ladder, the rope, but she was so cold and frozen, by the time the helicopter came back, she couldn't raise her arms out of the water, and it looked like she was going to drown. Everyone else on the bridge was screaming instructions to the people who were in the water trying to encourage them. Lenny Stutnik broke through the police barricade. I'm certain you remember the scene. He himself jumped into the river, risking his own life, and pulled the lady to shore, who otherwise would have surely drowned. The president called him a hero. What would Jesus have called him? In answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus would have said Lenny was a good neighbor. Of all the stories that Jesus told, this is perhaps one of his most famous stories, the story of the Good Samaritan. We have hospitals named after it, hospices, even campgrounds sometimes are named after it. The story is directly related to Lenny, all the Lennies of the world. The story begins with a lawyer who asked a good question with a bad motive. Remember how it started? The lawyer stood up in order to test Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus doesn't really answer that question, does he? He asks another question. What are we taught? What's written in the law? How do you read it, he says. And the lawyer responds with the perfect answer, the perfect Jewish answer. Love God, he says. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered rightly. If you do that, you'll live. It'll be fine. Now, at first, I'm sure that the man was quite smug with getting the right answer and perhaps leading Jesus down a road that he wanted to entrap Jesus in, although we don't know what the trap was because the smile doesn't last very long. Wanting to know the limits of his liability for love, the lawyer is looking, of course, for a good loophole. He's trying to separate people into two categories. Neighbors and non-neighbors. And so he asks the question, well then, who is my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? To which Jesus responds by telling one of the most famous stories and provides a shocking answer to them then and equally to us today. He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. The thing about the story is that the hero, the Good Samaritan, is surprising. In fact, he's offensive. He's the offensive hero that Jesus is, taught, is teaching at the center of his story. The hero of this story is totally unexpected. And this neighborly act is both surprising and offensive to those who listen to Jesus. You see, Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. They were leftovers and half-breeds from the exilic period about 500 years before. And in this story, they're the centerpiece of those to whom the law of the neighbor, of loving the neighbor, is to extend. And in fact, the Samaritans, even beyond that, in this case, the Samaritan is the one who is fulfilling the extension of the law to love your neighbor. He is the Lenny Stucknick of his day. He's the unexpected hero, the surprising hero, the preposterous hero, the impossible hero. It's unheard of, it's ridiculous, and it's offensive to those who are listening. 
We name hospitals after it because we sort of lose the offense. But we know the offense of the other. Today, our unity as a nation stands in black and blue, bruised by tensions and divisions. Black lives matter, blue lives matter, all lives matter, and white America can't understand the outrage or understand our privilege and the system that's rigged in our favor. The events of this week, both the killing of black men in Louisiana and in Minnesota, and the targeted killings of police officers in Dallas, police officers who were, who were assigned to protect and serve a very rally against them. These events leave us understanding that we as a people and as a nation are deeply divided. It's not just the rhetoric of a nation's elections, it's the nation itself for which we should mourn. So one might be surprised when unexpected bridge builders appear, like, well, Snoop Dogg, for example, who showed up at a rally to be a bridge builder for peace. One might be surprised when radical compassion is shown between factions, between enemies, but it happens. This week it was reported, although it happened in June, Dallas area television station WFAA reported Thursday the following story of a group of inmates in Waterford, Texas, who managed to break free from their reinforced cell. Nothing new there, is there? But they broke free from their cell. Do you remember this? Did you hear the story? They broke free from their cell in order to save their jailer, who appeared to have had a heart attack. Eight prisoners were behind a locked door on June 23rd in a holding cell of the District Torch Building in Parker County when the officer, who, after joking with them, slumped over. He just fell over, inmate Nick Kelton's told the station. Looked like an act, but he could have died right there. After Kelton and the inmates realized something was terribly wrong, they started yelling for help. When no one came, the shackled inmates broke out of their reinforced holding cell. The guard didn't have a pulse, so the inmates started shouting and banging on doors so loudly that the deputies downstairs in the court thought there was a fight. Deputies told the station they didn't know what to expect when they got downstairs. The jailer hold, had both keys to free them on himself and a gun to defend himself. It could have been an extremely bad situation, Parker, Sher Parker County Sheriff Sergeant Ryan Spiegel told the reporter. When deputies realized what was going on, they got the inmates and began CPR in the officer. Captain Mark Arnett said the prisoners likely saved the officer's life. The jailer, who has not been identified, is expected to return to work next week. The inmate said, I watched him die twice, and it never crossed my mind not to help whether he had a gun or a badge. If he falls down, I'm going to help him up. Who is my neighbor? In this case, it's a surprising group of people, isn't it? A group of inmates who were the unexpected good neighbor to a police officer who was there to jail them. Who is your neighbor? Jesus answers the question by radically opening up the definition of what neighbor means. It's not just the person next door. It isn't just the person up the street. It's not a person who goes to your school or who lives in your community, a fellow Californian or a fellow Lutheran or a member of your party, fill in the party of your choice. No, the person who is your neighbor is the person who is in need. This is a countercultural teaching. In our case, Jesus is the model of the good neighbor. According to Philippians 2, Jesus put aside his divine privilege and his power, became a servant of humanity, even accepting a violent death at human hands on the cross, so that God's love can be worked into our lives. He can show us a way to live out of God's love, for our love for God and for neighbor, and so we can be redeemed. Jesus pays the price for us and promises to come back for us. You see the model of the Good Samaritan right here in the story that Jesus tells about what he's going to do? He's going to pay the price for us and come back for us. It is a highly political story in Jesus' day and ours. It's a story about God's work in the world, 
working against the way things work in order to redeem and to save. And that story, that narrative of redemption has a people. It's called the church. And we too are a counter-cultural movement representing God's redemption in the world. The world, it doesn't teach us such things, at least not on the direct route. Sometimes by byproduct we'll learn about self-giving, but in the world we learn more about greed and self-protection. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. We feel this in our bones, don't we? Sometimes, too many times, corporate and personal greed makes it worse. What's yours is going to be mine, and I will take it. We see too many examples of that. Both the legalism of protecting my things and the lust for desiring after the things of others, neither are the way of Jesus. Both greediness and grabbiness are the things to which we are called to repent. Instead, the way of Jesus is like this. But a Samaritan, the outsider, while traveling came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put them on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. He came near others. He saw him. How many times in Luke, even in, this, in the Sundays of uh, the summer, have we heard the word, the person was seen. The Samaritan sees the other person in need. He has compassion for them. He gets involved. He's no passerby. He's no bystander on a bridge. He cares for them. He, it costs the Samaritan time, energy, his own personal safety, and money. He paid the price. In a world like ours now, a world where lament is too often heard, the time for the church to sit on its hands in apathy and self-protection and self-care and concern only about ourselves is over. There can be no more bystanders. I don't think there probably ever was, according to the gospel bystanders, because by the way, I checked the date on this particular story, it's over 2,000 years old. Maybe Jesus had this no bystanders allowed policy in place all along. There can be no more bystanders. The world needs us. They are beaten and bloodied and in danger. Our culture has lost its way and follows the legalisms of self-protection and of lust for other people's stuff of greed and grabbiness, of anger and revenge. None of these things are the good news of the gospel. Someone must show them the way of life. Someone must show them what good life is really like. We must insist on justice for those who receive none. We must be a people, church, who will cross the uncomfortable aisle to be with those who are different than us. We must have a new way beyond self-protection, beyond lust and legalisms, beyond greed and grabbiness, about violence in our culture and how much we accept it, about guns in our culture and the laws that make sense and protect lives and not just fringe liberties. I mean. To me, it doesn't make much sense that somebody on a terror watch list can legally purchase a gun. Does that make sense to you? We must insist, as God's people told to control our tongues, we must insist on civility in our conversations with one another. And in every level of leadership, from Washington to Little League, conversations after church, and Facebook posts, and bumper stickers. And we, church, must lead again with this strange word called virtue. Virtue. And honor. Because laws do not make people good. God makes people good. And that's an inside job. And someone must show them the way. 
And if it isn't us, then who? We must be, as Gandhi said, we must be the kind of change we want to see in the world. We must be the kind of change we want to see in the world. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is our good neighbor. If you're like Jesus, you'll strive to be a good neighbor to those in need too. And be the change, as Jesus was, that God longed to see in the world. And that change has a people. And that people is named the church. And that is you and me. I read a story one time about a man, I think I've told this story before, working in a shoe store in Europe. It was during winter time, and he noticed a barefoot little boy outside the, the baker shop next to the door of the shoe store. He was at the baker shop, not because he was staring through the window, but because the grate in the front of the baker shop was pumping out the hot air from the stoves, and so he was trying to keep warm on the grate, blowing hot air up out of the bakery. Here was the store owner, surrounded by shoes, and a little boy without shoes, and the storekeeper was uncertain as to what he should do about that little boy. And all of a sudden, a middle-aged woman walked up the sidewalk, and she stopped at the little boy and looked at him. She bent down and spoke some kind words to the child, and then she turned and brought him into the shoe store and bought him brand new shoes and socks. As that shivering boy in the cold put on those warm shoes and socks, he said to the lady, are you God's wife? No, son, she said. I'm just one of his children. He smiled and said, Well, I know you must be kin of his somehow. When God is in our heart, virtue is born. When God is in our heart, love is worked into us, and it begins to overflow toward others. When you get love in your heart, you realize everybody, regardless as to who they are, where they come from, or the color of their skin, or the creed they confess, all of them are our neighbors. Just like Jesus, you'll be there. The annoying presence of the Spirit opens our eyes to see the suffering of the world, and it demands that we don't sit on our hands or stand on a bridge yelling platitudes or encouragement, but with self-risk fully acknowledged to jump into the icy rivers, preferably, proverbially, of the Potomac to save lives. There is no more time for bystanders. It's time for God to show up in unexpected, surprising people like you and me and in unexpected and surprising places right where God is needed. May we have courage. Why do I feel like I'm saying that same line at the end of every one of my sermons? May we have courage to move beyond that which is easy for us. May the Spirit not leave us in peace until we do so to make a difference for all the world and that we would understand that because of the gospel of Jesus, the God who lives and dies for us to give us life, we can no longer be bystanders. Amen.